and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 433, a two-episode special. First, an interview with Andrew Nagorski about his book, Saving Freud, and then we continue with the Dieppe Raid with Hero or Madman. Mr. Nagorski, a longtime favorite of this podcaster, has written such books as 1941, The Year Germany Lost the War, The Greatest Battle, covering the Battle of Moscow and the Nazi Hunters. Today we cover the incredible story of Sigmund Freud's escape from Vienna after the Nazis had taken over there. Mr. Nagorski, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Ray. A pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, uh, full disclosure, I'm a big fan. I'll try very hard not to geek out, but I loved all your previous books, and, I, and I'm just very excited. One, that you wrote this particular book, and we'll get into that, and two, that I get a chance to uh, to talk to you about it. So let's, if we could, let's just jump into this, and let's tease the audience a little bit. So it's sure. March 15th, 1938. Three days after the Nazis have marched into Austria. Now, most of us would be thinking, these guys are pretty bad. They're pretty brutal. Let's let's get out of town while the getting's good. But there was one man in particular who did not want to leave Vienna, Austria, even though the Nazis are coming in. And he's not exactly your average Austrian. In fact, he is probably the most famous. He's the most pe- famous person in Vienna and maybe... In, you know, aside from the politicians and people like Hitler, the right. most famous uh, public figure in, in Europe and even in the and very well known in the United States, that's Sigmund Freud. Uh, right. He's 80, 81 years old at that point. And one of the interesting things that I found in, in researching this book is that mm-hmm. most people don't even think of Freud as living until... Hitler comes to power and World War II is right right on the horizon. He was born in 1856, so he's you think of him as a mid-century figure, a mid-turn-of-the-century figure in the early 20th century. But in fact, he lived, he had a long life, and he was very much aware that Hitler was coming to power in Germany. He was aware of these forces gathering. But remember, at that point, Austria was still a separate country, and he had the hope, uh, and let's say maybe it was was a a rather naive naive hope in some ways that that somehow uh, Austria could could manage to survive this Nazi storm uh, just next door. Uh, And as you say, many Austrian Jews had left already, uh, realizing that that was unlikely, but Freud was still firmly implanted in his own apartment, in his own offices, and trying to keep his head down. Right. And, and can I just say on a side note real quick, after reading your book, you made me fall in love uh, with Vienna. I, I've definitely got to go there um, one day. But no, you, I, I love the way you incorporated other people and and uh, various parts, various famous cities uh, throughout the world in the book. And we'll get to that. But um, I do have a lot of younger people listening to this podcast. So Sigmund Freud, I'm sure they probably heard of the name. They don't know very much about it. So for the average, say, 18 year old that's listening to this right now, what should they know about Sigmund Freud before we go on? Well, I think Freud these days, if you talk to psychologists, uh, he, he's, the, he's the father of modern, modern psychology. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of say, if you talk to psychologists, psychiatrists these days, a lot of them will say, well, Freudian ideas are no longer as relevant. A lot of them are or maybe a little oversimplistic. But in fact, most of our ideas about the human mind and our understanding today, we all take it for granted that there's something called the subconscious, that there right. are forces that that mo- that motivate our actions and, and, and make us do things and that our dreams, for instance, and repressed memories and all of these things play a role. Before right. Freud, no one talked about that. No one wow. understood that. Mm-hmm. And you, know, you had people thrown in mental hospitals and and you just saw the dealing with the the uh, sort of physical results of that right. or the psych the, but the idea that you've got to try to understand what what is motivating people's behavior those who were suffering from severe mental disorders but even ordinary people 
Mm-hmm. We don't do not. You can't understand the human mind unless you have some some awareness of what the subconscious is. And that was, I think, Freud's biggest contribution. And he was very determined to 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 make some sort of breakthrough in understanding the human mind and how you deal with the with with especially with mental disorders. And right. he experimented with all sorts of things in the beginning, cocaine, uh, hypnosis, and so forth, and, re- and realized that those were not the solutions. And eventually, he came up with what was initially called the talking cure, which right. is what we what we ta- think of. But, you know, you go into a psychiatrist, and and you you talk about your problems, mm-hmm. your childhood, your memories, your dreams, and gradually you try to unearth what is causing whatever is bothering you your depression and your neuroses or whatever and that that was that was freud's big breakthrough and, right. and he and he also had a freud had a good sense of branding he realized the talking to <laughs> was not was not exactly a catchy phrase right. <laughs> and, uh, and and, he, and and it became psychoanalysis much better much yeah. better. If if I could real quick, and this is I'm just going to make this personal for a second. A very long time ago, many decades ago, I you know I saw a therapist for a for a year, and he was like, you know, this is kind of like peeling an onion. Um, mm-hmm. It's painful, and the further you go, it's more painful. But the relief that you get by facing your pain versus avoiding it with drugs or alcohol, you know, that that's the whole point is to literally to understand the pain, to transcend it, to learn to live with it. And here's a guy who is literally breaking this down into a science. He's trying to spread the word, and he's kind of figuring. I guess he's you know he's he's a trailblazer. He's figuring things out as he goes. Yes, absolutely. I think that peeling the onion uh, uh, metaphor is a very mm-hmm. good one. Um, that that was what Freud felt he had to do, and now is it's taken for granted that that's if you're going to deal with right. if you're 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 either a practitioner or a patient, uh, you, you have to you have to do that at some level to be able to address whatever problems you are 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 your your patient is having. And Absolutely. by the way, I just yeah. backed that for a second. Thank yeah. you for the remark, remark about Vienna. Uh, yeah. I, I've been in and out of Vienna for decades and love wow. the city. It leaves a lot of conflicting feelings because there, there are many negative associations, but it is a gorgeous city and it's, an, and it's just a capt- captivating city. And in a way, I felt that in my book, I tried to make almost a Vienna another character in the book. Yes, you did. You did because now it's on my list. I've got to get there. Uh, and of course, go check. I think there's a uh, Freud museum there now where he lives. Yes, there or there Vienna. is. Uh, there uh-huh. are in Vienna. Freud lived almost his entire adult life in, a, in, in, in at one address in a, an apartment where he he had his his uh, office. His mm-hmm. study, and then he also had his personal quarters. He eventually had a family. He had he had six children, a uh, wife and six children, and right. so it's a large, rather large uh, combination of office and residence. Mm-hmm. And that, when he left Vienna, he left that behind. Now that is the Freud Museum in Vienna. But interestingly enough, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, since sure. he spent. The last year of his life in London, that he also had a house in London eventually, and mm-hmm. that too is a Freud museum. <laughs> so there are two Freud museums. Both are very interesting in different ways. Right now, I have to check out both of them. Okay, okay. and I think this the second one is is it just outside of London? Is that it's in it, it's in London, but in the in the area called Hampstead, which is uh, not right in the center. Gotcha. But it's not not far. It's all. It's still considered uh, very much. Uh, you know, it's part of the municipality of London, but it's a more right. r- residential street. in In Vienna, it's 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 a typical uh, apartment building. Right. Um, and 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 there, it's it's a house, a very nice house, mm-hmm. and 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 it has many of the of Freud's famous. Uh, possessions, including the the most famous, his couch, where he would right. where his his, his uh, patients would come and 
lie there and 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 tell their story. That's great. Oh, I would definitely love to see that. So again, so it's 1938. The Nazis have marched into uh, to Austria. Now you've you've said in your book, you know, he was in his he was in his early 80s. He's a man of habits, uh, and he's kind of hoping that you know this won't blow up and affect him, but it does. And so Freud, on one hand, is stubborn, and on the other hand, he's going to figure out that everybody who's been telling him to get out is right. But he's going to need help. Could you briefly describe some of the members of his, what's going to turn out to be his uh, unusual rescue team? Yes, that's, I mean, one of the things that really attracted me to this story is not just Freud, as Mm -hmm. I began to uh, explore his life, how interesting a personal personal life he had and right excuse me and how much he was he was a revolutionary thinker but at the same time as you say a very conservative in his lifestyle Mm -hmm. he attracted all these patients and and other colleagues who had let us say very flamboyant uh, (laughs) sexual and other lives because uh, the the nature of 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 what he was studying Right. But he himself was married to one woman all his life and, 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 and had a very set routine. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, meal times were at a certain time. The barber came in the morning to trim his beard. Uh, wow. he, he, he would come. He would then have a time for walking about, going to the cafes, reading the newspapers, maybe playing playing some cards or something with friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was very set in his routines. Right. And he did not want to break that. And as he gets older, as most of us know, as we get older, you tend to be more set in your routines. And so even though he was someone <laughs> who understood the human mind, you would think better than almost anyone at the time. And he yes. wrote about about what he called the, uh, the, the, the sort of the really dark, uh, aggressive forces propelling people to to take horrible actions against other others. Right. Uh, and, and he understood that totalitarian movements, whether it was the Bolshevik revolution in, in Russia or the mm-hmm. Nazi uh, takeover in Germany, were, were the, the capacity for evil there was, was almost yes. limitless. But he was hoping he could preserve his life the way it was uh, uh, until until the end and as an older old man he thought oh well there's not far to go so maybe i'll make it yeah he might he might have been an older man just hoping to live out his years but like you said he's the most well-known or at least the top two well-known austrians uh hitler being the other one but (laughs) uh yeah so there's going to be william bullet involved there's going to be the great grand niece of napoleon i mean this guy is collecting very influential people around him Yes, he is. He is interesting. And what, what what develops that I call his rescue squad, as you say, <laughs> is, is 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 this group of people who are attracted to him. Some of them right. come to him as patients initially. Right. For instance, as you mentioned, the great grand niece of Napoleon, Marie Bonaparte. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, Bonaparte, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte. Her right. grandfather was Napoleon's brother, and she herself is this very flamboyant French woman who mm. was married also to the prince of Greece and Denmark. Royalty in Europe is very complicated. Wow, yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, but she, and she is a, let us say, a very uh, busy and uh, independent woman and <laughs> uh, has all sorts of very high profile affairs, including with the prime minister of France. Wow. And, but feels sexually unfulfilled. Right. And and seeks uh, seeks to get treatment from Freud. And why is it that despite all her efforts, she can't feel fulfilled? Right. And she right. goes to Vienna and not only is treated by him, but then becomes a close colleague and is so, so intrigued by psychoanalysis and what Freud is doing that she becomes a psychoanalyst herself and a major supporter of his movement financially and in every other way, organizing organizing efforts to to expand this study of psychoanalysis yeah so she she's one of them and and this starts in the 20s Mm -hmm. where she she becomes associated william bullet who is from a very prominent uh, philadelphia family a famous journalist 
and then the U.S. ambassador first to the Soviet Union, then to France, mm -hmm. also comes to him in the 20s with some personal problems. His marriage has, was falling apart and so forth. Right. And then they bond over the fact that both of them despised Woodrow Wilson and felt <laughs> he really botched the end of World War I and the Treaty yeah. of Versailles right. and, and decide to write a book together. And they become very close associates. And by, in 1938, when this is happening, Bullitt is the U.S. ambassador to France, and he has mm. oversight of the U.S. mission in Vienna. And he assigns one of his friends to watch out for Freud. If the Nazis try to, if, if something happens and they try to touch him, we've got to help protect him. Right. And and then there 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 is Ernest Jones, a, 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 one of Freud's earliest followers. He's British. Mm -hmm. He's a Welshman who had all sorts of scandals attached to his name, but right. was a really a real enthusiast of, uh, of Freudian psychoanalysis. And a major mover and shaker in the in what becomes the the world say, international psych, psychoanalytic movement, right. and he also comes in, uh, and and then he, uh, there's Freud's youngest daughter Anna Freud. Right. Uh, she is the one who stays. In, all the other kids grow up, marry, and 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 live independently, although they have close ties with their parents. Mm -hmm. But Anna never does. She stays with her in, in living with her parents, and and also develops a very close personal relationship with her father, and becomes a psychoanalyst herself, a child, a very noted child psychoanalyst, but right. also is major sort of home caregiver, because the other factor that's that's uh, that's very important here is that mm -hmm. Freud in the twenties develops. Uh, cancer of the jaw from right. his from his cigar smoking. Mm -hmm. He loves cigars. He always said, "If I do, if I'm not smoking, I can't think. If I can't think, I can't write." And he was always <laughs> thinking, writing, and treating patients. So uh, always smoking <laughs> and always smoking, and refused to give it up. And it got worse and worse. And right. and Anna helped him tremendously as he went through progressive operations and had a, pro a very painful prosthesis in those days. The, mm. the devices were nothing like the devices we have today. Right. Uh, so she is a very devoted daughter and professional colleague. And she is a, she becomes sort of the center of this effort to try to protect Freud when the Nazis come in, in terms of dealing with the Nazi authorities. Wow. And so I, you, you have this cast of characters and there are a couple more, mm -hmm. including, by the way, a, uh, a, a Nazi official who becomes kind of a, a almost this was the big surprise to me to discover that a Nazi official who was who was put in charge of the Freud family. They were they were assigning officials to be in in charge of of dealing with the major Jewish families in Vienna. Gotcha. And and basically and then expropriating any wealth they had, uh, and then it wasn't clear what was going to happen next. And and this man Anton Sauerwald eventually spends a lot of time in the Freud household in the offices, and he comes across as a raging anti-Semite to begin with. <laughs> but yes. then then it, it turns out that he had he he had studied at the University of Vienna where Freud taught. Mm -hmm. And a colleague of Freud's had been a Jewish colleague of Freud's had been his chemistry professor. And he sort of identified Freud with his now deceased chemistry professor. And he begins to take some, it, it, it make some decisions that are also critical to his escape. I'll leave the details of it perhaps to, to right. I hope readers of the book, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a mixture of people. That is that is fascinating to see, and uh, and, and there is also another American involved. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, Anna Freud, who was always seen as sort of this spinsterish woman, very right. much alone. But in fact, she had a close partner, uh, but not, she was never married. Mm -hmm. But in fact, in effect, she had a partner for life in Dorothy Tiffany uh, Burlingham. And right. from the famous American Tiffany family, oh. uh, the founder of, of the, the, the uh, Tiffany Tiffany Company 
and her father it was her grandfather, and her father was 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 uh, the one who was known for his wonderful glasswork. Gotcha. And this woman who had four kids was divorced. Uh, uh, had come to Vienna to de- had, to have Anna deal with her four kids because Anna's specialty was children, right. and they formed a lifelong relationship. And she too plays a big role in this story. Right. If I could, real quick, you were you were wisely mentioning just a second ago, you know, leaving a lot of the details uh, for the readers because that's what's exciting about it. But the other thing I want the readers to know. Uh, Because right now, you know, I'm just uh, we're just kind of setting up the premise. This book reads like a ticking time bomb that's about to go off. Is he going to get out? Is he not? Are the Nazis closing in? So uh, I just want everybody to know that this truly is one of those things that the tension builds as we go. And, And I just have to say one more thing before we go to the next question. Because I have four daughters, I'm always sensitive to the the to the female characters in books. And the one the one woman that I we, we have to mention is Freud's wife. He can yes. have this incredible schedule. He can have this big house, but she's the one that's running everything. She's the one that's making it possible. And I didn't want to let that go by. Oh, I think, I thank you for bringing that up because yeah. often she's overlooked because Anna, the daughter is such a major professional and personal presence, but Martha exactly. Freud, who mm-hmm. did not get involved in in the in the actual professional part of his job, but she she was like, she was actually she was originally from from Hamburg, and some and her one of her sons compared her to a little like a a a, a Prussian quartermaster <laughs> who made everything work in the household yes. because it was the office, it was the kids, it was you know Freud, a constant stream of patients. And she orchestrated everything, and she was so dedicated to, to him, the family, and um, right. she. I think she's she's a very powerful, quiet presence uh, in yes. his life and in in the book. Yes, he can have his schedule all he wants, but unless she's there, it's going to fall apart. So credit where credits due. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, but so Freud is literally thinking up new ways. He's, he's, he's literally, you know, tapping into something that hasn't been done before. You know, yes, the cocaine or whatever, but let's talk about it. Let's get into feelings. Let's get into dreams. Let's get into sexual um, impulses, because even though that makes people uncomfortable in the Western world, that's a big part of what drives a human being. And because there's a, there's, there's a sexual element to it, um, not only that, but also because he's Jewish, this stuff is going to be, even though he's literally developing it as he go and he gets better. Oh, and can I just say, I lost count of the number of people that turned to psychoanalysis. You know, they, they were with him and they're like, this stuff is amazing. I want to be a part of that too. Anyway, I, I found that, found that great. But the Jews, ha- excuse me, the, uh, the Nazis have something firm to attack him on. And forget Nazis for a second, just conservative elements. I mean, between the sexual component and the fact that he's Jewish, I guess there's a lot of ways to go after this guy and enable and excuse me, and label him and what he's doing degenerate. Yes. Uh, it, uh, first of all, on a point about Freud being Jewish. I mean, mm-hmm. of course, it becomes a major element because of mm-hmm. the Nazis and the anti-Semitism. Freud himself was not religious at all. Right. He was a, considered himself an atheist. But as he said, I never turned my back on Judaism and my heritage. And so yeah. when he when he was confronted with anti-Semitism, even before the Nazis, he would always stand up and, and face anybody who was trying to harass him or his family. So he right. was very principled in that respect. He said he, he kind of, and he, even Martha was from a far more religious, his wife was from a far more religious family. Her grandfather had been a grand rabbi in Hamburg. And, and sometimes he even teased her about religious rituals, which he thought were kind of meaningless. But in fact, he respected the, the heritage, uh, the religious and the cultural heritage of Judaism. Right. Uh, but uh, as as for... The, but but as you say, what was shocking to people, mm-hmm. and here we are at the late 19th century, early 20th century, was his emphasis on sexuality. Right. And that the motivation for so much 
of our of our actions is in some way sexual. Of course, the most famous thing is the Oedipus complex, mm-hmm. which was a term he came up with, and the notion that 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 boys actually are trying to replace their fathers in their relationship with the, with their mothers. Right. Uh, these were, yeah, you know, for a society which was conservative with a small C, but deeply so. <laughs> right. Uh, as but, much yeah. of, much of many societies were at the time. Yeah. The idea that that uh, you you not only talk about sexuality so openly, but then uh, reveal that even so-called proper people go through phases in their lives where they're dri- driven by sexual impulses that uh, sometimes they're not even aware of was it would it turn many people against him. And there was criticism. I mean, there you can read even in, in some of the in coverage in, in this country. I remember reading some account in, in the early days of Freud's movement where one, one psychologist who came over from the United States came and, and had spent time with Freud and then gave a speech back in New York saying how the, this is a deeply depra- depraved uh, notion mm. from a deeply depraved man, wow. which was the, the I, 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 you know, those were not exactly his words, but something to that effect, sure. which was, couldn't be further from the truth because as I said, he was, he himself, he, as he told Marie Bonaparte, his colleague once, mm-hmm. you know, I'm all for, for a far more open human sexuality and more sexual freedom, except I have very little use for that myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, he, I, he, he was not he, he was not acting on those impulses as people's people uh, suspected he w- who didn't know him thought he was right. No, but what I like about him is like he was just like let me examine what it is to be human, and I will accept. What I find, I won't try to squeeze it into a preconceived notion, whether it's religion or whether it's the race or whatever. He was just literally, you know, trying to walk a path that, yes, at times uncomfortable, but it leads to the truth of what it means to be human. Yes. Yeah. You can see that in so many, so many aspects. I mean, for instance, even his views on homosexuality, which, again, at that in that era were. You know, it was deeply hidden and often, uh, you know, was seen as an aberration. He right. would talk about it sometimes in terms that in today's world, we'd say we'd cringe a little bit, say <laughs> that's not the way you talk about it. But right. in fact, his, he, he, was, he had in a number of cases, actually a number of American mothers mm-hmm. uh, were in touch with him and wanted to send their sons over to be treated by him. And then he realized they were trying to get him to treat Treat them for being home uh, for being gay. Oh, right. And and Freud would say, "Look, don't don't have great expectations here. I can talk to your son, or you know, deal with the, you, you know, treat your son. Yeah. But this is not conversion. You're not right. if 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 this person is if your son is truly of that inclination. Mm-hmm. I found that usually what happens is that what therapy can do." is make him accept himself as he is, right. but not ch- change him fundamentally. And in, again, in that era, that approach was incredibly enlightened uh, yeah. and incredibly rare because it was yeah. it was treated as a sickness, as, as something that needed to be cured. And, and Freud realized that, that, that that's not the right approach. Uh, he, as you say, he was much more accepting of the human condition. That's why... He could he could have his own lifestyle, which would be one sort of lifestyle, very conservative, and then be very, very accepting of someone like Ernest Jones, the British psychologist, who had right. a totally different lifestyle and <laughs> yes. multiple multiple affairs, multiple scandals, and not be shaken by that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and because and at the end of the day, that's the whole point of therapy to learn about yourself and to accept yourself. And not be bothered by every. I mean, yeah, the man was he was brilliant, and and thank goodness he did what he was, you know. And 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 not only is he developing the science, but he's also 
quite keen to make sure that this science survives, that it spreads, that other people get involved. And he was constantly pushing it. And it wasn't just so much ego. It was also, this stuff can be effective. Let's get it out there so it can help people. Yes, yes. He had, from the very beginning, this urge to make sure this wasn't just something that was developed around his kitchen table, which, oh, which right. was the way it started. You right. know, that he, he, he and a few other young uh, doctors who were interested in this field began to develop their ideas and discuss it in these Wednesday evening dinners, uh, not mm-hmm. dinners, but, but meetings in, in, his, in his home. Uh, but then he was very eager for others to, uh, for this to spread, to be, uh, to be accepted in other countries and, to, and for, for this movement to grow. And, and he also was very conscious all his life. He thought he would not live very long uh, or right. not have a very long life. Hmm. He was almost obsessive about this. He would, he would make calculations when he thought he was going to die based on on when his father or uncles had died. Oh, right. And so at one point he was convinced himself he would die between the age of 61 and 62 and therefore he's <laughs> get everything done. And, and, uh, but then, so, but, and then of course, while he of course lived much longer than that, his illness and so forth contributed to that. So he had right. a sense, I've got a mission, I've got things I want to write. Uh, he wrote uh, you know, a lot of the r- initial works that are the basis for psychoanalysis, and then he had his own historical themes and somewhat quirky subjects. Right. Uh, but but he just wanted to get everything on a footing, and that's why from the very beginning he was thinking of 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 getting someone who would be his successor mm-hmm. uh, or, oh, or right. someone who could carry on the movement after he's gone, and that's that that prompted him to to really seek people from the outside. And initially his friendship with Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, uh, which he he thought he would be a good successor, but then they had a big falling out. And, uh, but anyway, anyway, this was his consciousness of mortality is there throughout. It's not, as you say, in the book, there's a sense of time ticking and, and sort of political mortality that this movement, this terrifying movement may, extinguish everything but he also had just a a conventional human mortality he was aware of that all the time yeah and and like you said it pushed him very hard it pushed him uh to accomplish this because and i think you mentioned this in the book he just doesn't want this to die out after he's gone this is not a cult of personality this is its own science based on its own merits and someone needs to pick up the baton after me so i'm glad that he was that aggressive because we certainly benefited from that so sticking with, and, and now if we could, I'd like to go in a very different direction. So it's okay. around 1897. It's in Vienna. Freud is there. He's falling in love with the city. There's a lot going on. And yet there was another young, very young Austrian there uh, named Adolf Hitler. So while Freud's thinking about the human condition, Hitler's thinking about pan-Germanic movement. He's thinking about nationalism. He's thinking about taking over the world, if I can use that expression. Very two di- very different people. Well, very different people. And of course, there's also, Freud is born in 1856. Hitler is born in 1889, so he's a lot younger. Right. But, uh, and he's in, from the Austrian provinces. He comes to, hit, uh, to Vienna for the first time as a uh, 16 or 16 or 17-year-old. Mm-hmm. In 19, I think it's 1906 or 1905, with the ambitions to be an artist. Uh, right. As we know, most of it, I think a lot of your listeners know, at one point he believed he'd be an artist and he actually applied to the v- Vienna, school, uh, Vienna Institute of Fine Arts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had sort of competent uh, paintings, but nothing inspired. And he was, to, but Hitler always had a, 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 a much magnified view of his own abilities, and he was totally shocked when he was rejected. Right. Now, 
in retrospect, I'd say that's one admissions committee I'd like to have reconsider their their, their, their decision. <laughs> please take him. Please take him yeah. in. Please take him, and maybe we could have avoided <laughs> so much. countless and exactly. millions of deaths. But anyway, that's a, I'm sorry to be a little flip, but no, I mean I, I think the idea of yeah. But so Freud, so Hitler, yeah, for it's interesting that Freud. As a Jew in Vienna during the Habsburg Empire, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire is there, and it's mm-hmm. a pretty, compared to most other places and most other empires in Europe, it's a pretty tolerant place. Right. Uh, there are a mixture of nationalities. Jews are about 10% of the population of Vienna, and and they do very well, particularly in the sciences, the arts, and 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 other and and a number of other professions. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's anti-Semitism too, and there's that dark side of Vienna, what I call right. Hitler's Vienna. And, mm. and, and but there is there's also this Vienna where someone like Freud can really rise to the top, to, despite that, despite all that. Right. Uh, but. While Hitler gets there, so Freud is building his career, his reputation. Hitler gets there, he gets rejected in art school. He been, then he's down and out. He he has relatively little money. He had some time. He was actually uh, sleeping on the, in various worker hostels most of the time, and sometimes right. even on the street. And and he falls in with this sort of really embittered. A uh, drifting crowd of people uh, of 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 men who 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 are also very easy targets for anti anti Semitic theories, which were cruising around their various various uh, 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 little pamphlets and uh, mm-hmm. uh, right. uh, newspapers that you know spelled out these all these conspiracy theories, and of course when you're down and out, the easiest thing to, to grasp at is someone says, well, it's all because of these people, whoever right. these people are. And in the yeah. and the Jews were that target. And that's probably where the worst of Hitler's anti-Semitism and where the really you know, it was was Hitler an anti-Semite from birth? I don't know. Uh, sure. I don't think so. But uh, I mean in, he was in the Austrian countryside where there's plenty of anti-Semitism, but there were also there's not. There's less indication of that. There. There's definitely indication that whatever anti-Semitic uh, it, it, impulses and theories were growing in his mind were really, really became came to the fore in, in uh, during that time in Vienna, where where he 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 was he was miserable and resentful and right and, and that that so you had those two Viennas. Yeah, exactly. Well put. Yeah, the one who's a gentleman is working very hard. He is planning out his life and and applying himself. And the other one's got delusions of grandeur. And he's also victim blaming and the whole spiel. And then it's a dark spiral that goes to war goes to. Yeah. So uh, I've always found it interesting. People that are uh, have massive insecurities want to compensate by uh, grabbing for power. And I guess Hitler maybe is the ultimate example of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. if I could, so uh, I'm going to skip some things again. We want to save it for the readers, but the the great war comes. Um, uh, one of Freud's daughters die from the Spanish flu. He has a grandson that then dies. And you mentioned already uh, the um, the cancer in the jaw, numerous surgeries. I don't think I knew that before I uh, before I read your book, but that was something that he had basically had to deal with for the rest of his life. And did I read this correctly? The doctor at first did not tell him that he'd found a malignant growth or, yes. or yes. Is, was that the standard to not? I, tell it, I think that often happens. Right. Uh, I think it. I I think in some societies in Europe, that still can happen. I mean, it's maybe not right now, but until fairly recently, it was the idea that that you did not necessarily share the worst news. Um, You want to Ah. not to theoretically to spare the patient and their family the uh, the, this, but it was hardly. And Freud was furious (laughs) when he found out that his own doctors. Uh, and by the way, Ernest Jones, who was 
who is his colleague from Britain, mm -hmm. first was included in that with that information. And Jones hesitated before telling Freud. And oh. Freud was furious at Jones, although he later forgave, forgave him. But mainly his, his personal doctors who had kept this from him initially said, you know, I, I need to know what's going on. And, and so, of course, that uh, he, he, as a doctor himself, he, he thought it was absolutely almost criminal not to tell tell him yeah. what was happening. Um, yeah. But yeah, so he was dealing with this from essentially from 1923 when the first operation took place Ooh. until the end of his life, which was another 16 years and and just endless operations and 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 and, and, and pain. Right. Oh my, yeah. Because when, when you know, there's a there's a lot of photos of uh, a Freud, but then there's the famous one where he's kind of scowling at the camera. He's got his hand on his hip, and I wasn't sure if that came from his personality or just the idea of him being in pain for decades. I'm sure that took a lot of resolve to have to deal with day in and day out. Well, yes, it did. Although I think it's interesting. I think those photos. Mm -hmm. uh, help account for the fact that most of us, myself included, before I I, I started researching this book, think right. of 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 uh, Freud as this very stern doctor <laughs> professor, yes. you know, and 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 you don't think of him having a sense of humor. What become kind of became very apparent to me as right. the more I went into it and 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 the accounts of people's dealings with Freud and his own letters, by the way, which are wonderful. That he had mm -hmm. had a very sharp but dry sense of humor, <laughs> and uh, and could really, you know, he he, he you know, had a way. Uh, it was not something a uh, ha ha humor, but it was right. it, it come out in certain moments. For instance, when he, in in the nineteen, I think it was nineteen twenty six or twenty seven, the only time he had a personal encounter with Einstein, of course, the other major Jewish figure of that time. Yeah. Uh, and everyone was curious. Well, so what do you talk about? <laughs> what is the meeting like? And and right. Freud said to, in a comment afterwards. He said, "Well, uh, I know much as much about about physics as Einstein Einstein does about psycho psychoanalysis." So we had a very pleasant conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Freud could come up with these kinds of lines all the time. And it, it was, oh. he, you know, he he was very. You know, he got got right to the. To, he could see the humor in a lot of things. Right. So I think those 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 photos. Yes, the pain and and everything are part of it. But I think it's just it's also there was a sense certain expectation in that era oh, right. that someone who's a doctor, a professor, is supposed to look serious. He's got yeah. He's got to be yeah. Yeah, exactly. that's why he always was well turned out. He had his. He always had his tailored suit and right. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and that beard just perfectly trimmed. All of that. That was part <laughs> of his image. And oh. I understand that. My Polish grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, who was who was close to that same. Well, I mean, he was not the same generation as Freud, but not that long after. Uh, in terms of his birth, but he he would even when he was in the states as an old man, that if he stayed with us, he would never come to breakfast without being dressed in a coat and tie. Yes, old school. It was old school, yeah. and that was just the way you behaved. He also had been a law. He, he, in his case, was a lawyer, but also had been a professor, and he had a certain status and expectation of how he was supposed to look. Yeah, don't don't disappoint the uh, the the public. I like that. Um, we're gonna skip some things again, leave it for the for the readers. But again, I I cannot stress this enough. Because of his life, because of his travels, because of all the different people he worked with and, and just got to know. I mean, your book covers, it's almost like a who's who of pre-World War II. That, like you mentioned, Carl Jung, Eric Erickson, Albert Einstein. But, and again, this is where the book starts to get a little darker, 1933, Hitler comes to power. And as much as Freud is obsessed, focused, whatever the proper word on his work, he does take notice of Hitler. Um, but he's, I guess he's hoping as long as I sit here and I do my little thing, I don't bother anybody. And Austria itself stays on its own path. We should be okay. Yes, 
And he he was, yeah, Austria was in a shaky position, and Austrians themselves were conflicted. Some people in Austria considered themselves that Germany, they should be unified with Germany. It's the same right. language, the same culture in many ways. But others felt that as an independent state, it was better off. Mm. Uh, and it wasn't, of course, Hitler from the very beginning, you read Mein Kampf, he starts off as, he, that he he believes Austria is simply a province of Germany, and he's Austrian born, but he this is it's all about German identity. But it, but yes, uh, I think Freud believed he wanted to believe that the Austrian politicians, who in those days, by the way, there was an Austri- there were various Austrian politicians who were you could call them fascist mm-hmm. or dictatorial, mm-hmm. but they were not. And yeah, you know, it was not the same thing as the Nazis. And he felt right. that these these kind of right wing Catholic politicians were actually trying to preserve Austria as a separate state. And one of them actually banned the uh, the, uh, the Nazi Party in Austria, and then wow. he was assassinated. Oh, wow. uh, okay. And so things were not going well, but he, but there was the hope that that Austria could survive. There was also, I think, a really almost naive hope that even when the really vicious anti-Semitism started under Hitler across the border in Germany, mm-hmm. that the Austrians wouldn't be, behave the same way. I call this a little bit like the, the sound of music theory about <laughs> Austria. <laughs> right. that, that the Austrians are different. They're not going to be so so receptive to extremist uh ideology and and hatred well right. of course as we know unfortunately they were and uh and and when hitler's forces came in they were greeted mm. rapturously by a yes. large part of the population not everybody of course but right. a large part and then later in once hitler it went, once it was incorporated into the third reich austrians served hitler and in fact austrians were very somewhat overrepresented running concentration camps and the like. So wow. uh, it, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, there's a lot of grim history there and uh, a lot of illusions that were shattered very quickly once, once uh, uh, Hitler took over Austria. Right. And of course, by then it's too late because the people with the guns are in the streets controlling everything. I, I thought that was such a, a poignant lesson that I hope is never lost, you know, because by the time you realize something, it can be too late and you and you can't make changes. So I'm going to skip a couple more things. And we're getting to where the pressure, the tension in the book is really mounting. Freud's being told by everyone who loves him, you got to get out of there. You got to get out of there. Um, the, the Nazis certainly are aware of him and they're, they're keeping tabs on on him, but then comes a moment, and I'm going to let you decide how how much detail you want to give because I'm sure you want to save something for the readers. But if you could kind of describe the moment when Freud realizes this is serious because something almost happens to his daughter Anna, and then of course yeah. he's got to get the heck out of there. Yes. Well, what happens is as soon as the Nazis march in and they come to Vienna, and Hitler makes a speech in Vienna with thousands of people there right to announcing the incorporation of Austria into the third reich and by the way that's a short walk away from from really? from, uh, from from where where uh, freud was living and working oh my uh, you, goodness. You, you can just walk from one to the other i i didn't time it but i think in 15 minutes or whatever right so it's it's uh it, it's it's happening right outside his windows essentially that's amazing and and right away some nazi thugs burst into his apartment and into what was called the international the psychoanalytic press which was an a a a printing operation the psychoanalytic movement had freud's movement had just just up the street right and they start threatening and immediately uh here's here you mentioned Martha Freud, his wife, and her mm-hmm. role. When when this group of thugs arrives at the apartment, uh Fro- she realizes the danger mm-hmm. and and she just decides the best way to handle this is to 
to pretend it's an ordinary visit and she'll be the polite <laughs> hostess. Right. And she said, won't the gentleman come in and invites them in and said, oh, but, and by the way, I, there's some money on the table. Maybe you'd like to take it. <laughs> and and then, then she sends Anna Freud, the daughter, back to where there's a safe where they have more money and they empty the safe and give it to him. Essentially try to buy them off. Right. And, and and they buy some time that way. And then at that point, Freud sort of who is who just comes comes and, and looks at them. He's right. this very stern old gentleman and gives them this really nasty look and they right. back out. <laughs> and some of them even say, Oh, uh, her, her doctor professor and he has a, we'll be back later <laughs> so sorry <laughs> so say, not they didn't quite say sorry but right right we'll they be, we'll took come their later. loot and but they, of course they would be back yeah but then begins every day these nazis arrive and then this this person who's who is called a trustee to oversee the operation to expropriate whatever freud the freud has yeah um uh, is there and but the key moment for Freud is when they the Gestapo shows up mm-hmm. and Anna Freud had been trying to talk with these Nazis to try to intercede and keep her father out of it as much as possible. And right. they take Anna Freud, stick her in a car, they're two mm. Gestapo cars, and they drive her off to the to the Gestapo headquarters. And Freud is beside himself. He doesn't yeah. know. What are they going to do with her? Is she coming back? And she's gone almost the entire day. She finally arrives back. And uh, and he's so relieved by, by some accounts. He actually cried when she came, which was something oh. Freud did not normally do. Right. And at that point, he, 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 he realized there's no more doubt. We have to get out. Because mm-hmm. he said, Martha and I are old. We 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 won't be around much longer, right. but Anna is a young woman with a with a great future if she could yeah. be allowed to have it. So we have at least, if nothing else, we have to get out for her sake. And so that's when he he green lighted every effort to get the whole the whole family out, but especially Anna. And, and was totally devoted to the. You know, you know, it was really hoping to get out and abandon any any final lingering thoughts that that they could survive in Vienna. Right. I, I can I just say real quick. I told uh, uh, out of my four daughters, the two youngest still live here, and I told them about this moment. And my youngest girl turned to me and she said, "So Freud loved his daughter more than he loved himself." Because he wasn't willing to leave for himself, but he was willing to leave in a second for her. And I went, yeah, you pretty much <laughs> summed that's it up. A, that's a wonderful <laughs> way of putting it. Please tell yeah. your daughter that she's very incisive. Yes. Yeah, she, he uh, thank he you. was totally that, yeah. devoted to his daughter. I mean, he was totally devoted to his family, but Absolutely. especially to Anna. Yeah. And, 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 and he didn't, he would have done anything for her. Right. So what comes next, which we're going to leave for the readers, and I'm sure they're yelling at us right now, we're going to leave The Great Escape. If, if that's OK mm-hmm. with you, you can obviously oh, sure. add sure. anything you want. But the, but, but the book is not done. Not only does Escape, like you said earlier, there's his time in the UK. He's got to figure things out. He still has his rescue team around him and others who are going to make his last few months or whatever uh, on, on this earth as, as as comfortable as he can. Plus, like you said, he's got to look out for his family after he's gone. So we're going to leave that for the re- reader. Um, I just saw on your website that the film rights to this have been sold. So I've done yes. enough. I've done enough interviews where people have turned books into movies or, been, or they've done the movies themselves. When they call you up, and you're on the set, you call me, I'll drive your car, I'll carry your bags for you. <laughs> it would just be so cool because you know they would have to go to Vienna to shoot yeah. some of this. 
And I just, if there's anything I can do to help, you let <laughs> I me. I appreciate the offer. As you can imagine, there have been a few people who uh, volunteered as well. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm not the first. Okay. <laughs> You're All not right. the first, but okay. yeah, the movie, right, the option has been, we've now signed a deal and it's, uh, it's uh, was something called Fuzzy Door Productions, which is Seth MacFarlane's production company. Wow. Um, if you know, you know yeah. uh, about him. And he was a big, he really enjoyed, he told me he really enjoyed the book. And so we'll see, you know, these, yeah. these things can take a long time. And also there's sure. a writer's strike in Hollywood and all. So, yeah. but, uh, but it was, but he, 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 they clearly love the idea of this, this part of the story, which we will leave for the reader, the great escape, especially. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward, and I certainly hope this is made into a movie. The casting, the sets, the costumes, I love I love stuff like that. Anyway, but I'm i am just gushing at this point. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Nagorski, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this, for this book. And again, it's Saving Freud, The Rescuers Who Brought Him to Freedom. Mr. Nagorski, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And best to your family and your daughters. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 433, Part 2, Hero or Madman. Thus far, Operation Jubilee was one for three. First, the success. The large guns to the west of Dieppe, near Beach Orange, had been taken out. However, it was the exact opposite on the far eastern end, at Yellow Beach. The Allied men there had been taken out, killed, captured, or wounded, and some barely escaped. But the German guns, they were still operational. Which leaves Blue Beach, and as we have seen, at least 200 lay dead on the beach there, with dozens captured and most of them injured. What was needed now, though, was a hero, a voice coming out of the emptiness, to give this attack some form, focus, and fortitude. What it got was silence. Just to be sure, one of the key components of Jubilee was for headquarters, i.e. Ham Roberts on the HMS Kalp, to be able to contact the invading forces anytime he wanted. But this was not the case. As much as this operation had been obsessed over, there seems to have been little thought given to how the enemy would react. So procedures and tactical orders did not take them, the Germans, into consideration, they should have. True, radio passwords and orders to check the lines regularly had been built into this raid, but the men never got off the beach. Plus, much of their equipment was either wet, shot up, or the operator himself was dead, wounded, or captured. But as we have seen, in time, Captain George Brown, the Canadian Forward Operations Officer, was able to use his radio which is how the Garth got the message that all was not well and that a rescue attempt was made, which only led to more death. Only a little after 7 a.m. did Lieutenant Commander Goulding, the Blue Beach Naval Officer, set foot on Robert's HMS Kelp to tell him what had happened. Now Roberts knew the truth. But backing up a bit, Green Beach was the western version of Blue Beach, as in it was on the western side of Dieppe and just outside the city limits. Thus, it was a supportive landing. But in some ways, it was the opposite of Blue Beach. The beach in front of Porville, the small town to the west of Dieppe, was Green Beach's location, and there the beach was long and the valley that the invaders needed to access was wide. So far, so good. Again, the opposite of Blue Beach's narrow opening. And more good news is that here, the invasion started out on time. The South Saskatchewans came ashore at 4.50 a.m. They would establish a beachhead here, and 30 minutes later, the Camerons of Canada would come to land and rush inland to attack the airfield at St. Alban. And if things went really well, then attack the divisional headquarters at Arc. But the South Saskatchewans were to do more than just beach duty. A company would head east and capture the guns on the cliffs above. Fortunately, this area had plenty of places for cover. 
After A Company took out the guns, their next target would be the radar station. C Company would also head east from Portville, but further inland. There, they would meet up with other forces, certainly those coming from Dieppe itself, and cause as much damage as they could. Then they would all fall back to the beach for embarkation, and all this is on paper. Let's see what really happened. As the landing craft carrying the Saskatchewans got close to shore, everyone expected German fire to rain down on them, but nothing happened. Yet when the last boat touched land, that's when the Germans opened up. No one could explain the delayed response from the enemy. They were just grateful. But now, there was work to do. D Company jumped onto the beach and ran for the seawall. On it was barbed wire, like in other locations. Soon, Lieutenant John Edmondson caught up to D Company and yelled for Bangalore torpedoes. And the response was, yelled back to him, We don't have any. Well, okay, then it was time for Plan B. But no one wanted to carry out Plan B. Still, Edmondson yelled out for wire cutters and ladders. These were quickly produced, and then the lieutenant and the men stared at each other. Who was going up the ladder? He was, the men's looks told him. Sometimes rank has disadvantages. With machine gun fire going over the top of the seawall, Edmondson climbed up, cut the wires as fast as he could, and then jumped down. However it happened, when he landed, he was still in one piece. The men of D Company, excited by this, raced over the wall, and most of them made it. Now having some perspective, when Edmondson and the others turned around, they could see that the unit had landed to the right or west of where they were supposed to come ashore. The plan had been for those companies heading to the east, once they landed, to be put ashore to the east of the River Sea those who were heading to the west, to the west of it. But what had happened and helped explain the lack of German response before they made sure was the majority of those landed were put ashore to the west of the River Sea, which meant those that needed to head east first had to cross the river, and that meant crossing a narrow bridge that was well protected with enemy guns on its eastern side. Thus, their quiet arrival had all been for naught at least for the objectives to the east of the River Sea. You know what helps me sleep well at night? Physical gold. If you feel the same as I do about what's happening to our dollar, it's time you look at a gold IRA. You can buy gold for your IRA slash 401k. Gold can't be tracked like digital currency. No one has to know what you're buying. There's no way to print more. My best resource for gold IRAs is Augusta Precious Metals. Their track record is no less than phenomenal. They have thousands of happy customers. They are the absolute best. They are amazing. Learn why thousands of Americans are getting gold IRAs. You need to contact Augusta Precious Metals and get their free guide. I'm serious. Text GOLD to 68592. Again, text G-O-L-D to 68592. Gold at 68592 or go to AugustaPreciousMetals.com. That's AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Pourville itself is rather small, with a single lane and places on either side of it to stay. The invaders set up a battalion headquarters in a garage, and their first order was to secure the town. It was in Pourville that the Canadians had to go looking for the Germans, as most of them were still in bed, despite the divisional commander's order otherwise. Many Germans came out in their underwear running, but they also held guns. Not that it mattered, as they were quickly subdued with enemy grenades and machine guns. C Company wiped out the guards around a hotel, which was full of foreign workers who were building up the bunkers in the area. As more of the invaders moved out, either to set up a perimeter or to carry out a mission, they came upon the enemy in force when they tried to get over the first rise of land. Quickly, Sergeant Harry Long went down, as he had been leading the men. They had been moving closer to a large house that, on their map, was labeled White House. However, around it were slit trenches, holding at least 50 Germans and four machine guns. With Long down, 
Lance Corporal Guy Berthelot and Private William Haggard took over. They told two of the three sections with them to stay put, but to offer covering fire. Meanwhile, they would take the third section around to the rear of the slit trench. The idea was basic, but effective. They would run right at the trench, which would force those inside to engage them, thus weakening the Germans' coverage of the front section. The third section ran forward, Berthelot firing his Bren from his hip. But not every German was ready to fire to the rear, and thus the Canadians got close. And with the intense exchange, the two sections in the front ran forward. What followed was a short but bloody exchange. Berthelot was wounded, yet all but 12 Germans inside were killed, and those 12 were taken prisoner. As mentioned, few of the landing party landed on the eastern side of the River Sea. Fortunately, these were joined by a few who actually crossed at the river's mouth near the channel. The Germans upstream for this did not see them. This section of Allied troops was called the Special Platoon, and they had the task of removing a strong point under the eastern cliff. The Special Platoon had to take out the Germans because those same Germans had a view of the road that other Allied troops would have to use to get further inland. But soon the Special Platoon was stopped in their tracks. Only after going 100 yards, the German machine guns were too intense. Like C Company before, their leader, a Lieutenant Leslie England, along with others, was wounded, so Sergeant Ralph Neal took over. They moved as close as they could to the enemy machine gun, but only had their light arms, so to try to move forward would be suicide. For now, they were pinned down. Meanwhile, nearby, but on the other side of the River Sea, A and D Companies had to get over the bridge to go back to the east side as their objective was on that side. But by now, the Germans were on alert, and the bridge was heavily covered, on both ends. Still, it was decided that Captain Murray Austin would take A Company across, while D Company offered up covering fire. Somehow, the majority of men of A Company did make it across, while others slid down the side of the ditch and waded across the water on the bottom. But once they were across, and they all gathered, they then found themselves pinned down by two pillboxes on a height above them. Soon the survivors of the special platoon saw this, and they backed away from their stymied position, and they ran over to Austin and his men. Altogether now, they were still trapped, and they stayed there for 30 minutes. Something had to give, or they may end up all staying as German guests for the foreseeable future which obviously did not appeal to one Private Charles Sodden. He looked around and told his comrades he's had enough. He was going to take out the bastards. And with that, he put a grenade into each hand, then walked up to the pillbox and casually threw in his two grenades, killing the enemy within and silencing their guns. Best guess is he got lucky and he walked a path within a blind spot. Of course, there were other Germans around, so the bridge was still covered. Yet Sonnen had made it. Forget the luck of the Irish. Here's an example of the luck of a Canuck. With that done, A Company started climbing the slope to get to the threat above. But there was one among them, not of them. He was Flight Sergeant Jack Nissenthal. He was asked and accepted to go with the Canadians, for he was to bring back something anything that would help London better understand the new Freya 28 system. Freya 28 was just the latest in German radar technology. The name itself comes from the Norse goddess, Freja. But there was a downside for this radar specialist. As Niesenthal was an RAF electronics expert in his own right, he could not be allowed to fall into German hands. So the men around him were told, if things look bad... Don't forget to shoot Niesenthal. That was now passed on to Austin and his team, and they moved out. Austin had the men behind him zigzag to minimize their chance of being shot. Even better, he found a series of drainage ditches, and he led his men down into them. But one by one, his men were getting hit or injured by mortar fire. Obviously, the Germans had already worked out how the enemy would approach in this area, 
if they got this far. Austin, once he figured this out, wanted to kick himself. Of course the Germans had planned for this. Reaching the top of the cliff, Austin and company took out the closest battery and then moved on. Their next objective was the radar station itself, and again, Austin led the men into a ditch. But the same sequence continued to happen. The Germans fired mortar rounds at the ditch, and Austin's men kept falling. By the time they reached the perimeter of the radar station, of the ten men with Niesenthal, three had just died, and three more were wounded but were able to walk. Austin needed the cavalry, or the Camerons. The Camerons, led by Colonel Alfred Gosling, had arrived on shore 15 minutes late, and this was Gosling's decision to do so. But running with these men on the beach was one Sergeant Maurice Swank of the U.S. Rangers. He was learning a lot, but being there will do that for you. And all the noise around him, the boat's engine, the mortar fire from the cliffs, the destroyers behind him, but all he could focus on was a bagpipe player near him or rather, the sound of the bagpipes. Swink would later say, Never in my life before had I been so emotionally stirred. And he meant the bagpipes, not the shooting all around him. Colonel Costling was confident that all would go according to plan. And seeing an educational moment arise, when a gun fired or a blast went off, he would tell the men around him what kind of weapon had made that sound. However, this knowledgeable man then led his troops to a spot on the left side of the beach, right in front of a German stronghold. So the question, obviously, is, how many seconds did it take for several bullets to find Gosling? Not many. Major Andrew Law was now in command, and his first decision was to decide whether or not to stick to the original plan, which had been to get on the road that ran along the east side of the Sea Valley, meet up with the Calgary tanks coming from Dieppe, and take out the other objectives. But Law decided it was best to change things up. Instead of meeting up with the tanks, he honestly didn't think he and his could reach that point, he decided on an alternative route, and then he would see what to do. Leaving one company to help the Saskatchewans, the Camerons set out. The problem for Austin and his Saskatchewans was that too many of them were still on the western side of the bridge and trapped there more besides. And they were taking fire from machine guns, mortars, and a four-gun 105mm battery just below Portville. The wounded were tended to as best as Captain Francis Hayter could, and then they were lowered back down to the beach and placed on the far side of the beach wall. But there is where they stayed, as landing craft were kept away from the beach by enemy machine guns and mortars. But again, at least here, they had some protection. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. As for the people of Poorville, the commandos and soldiers were told to ignore them. But as there is an exception to everything, representatives of the SOE, or Special Operations Executive, came along, they invited themselves, and they said, we might pick up a few individuals. Having said that, enemy combatants were another story. Soon, 25 POWs were rounded up, but not all of them looked German. Among them were four Polish conscripts, and a firm-looking German NCO to keep an eye on them. The Poles began to talk, but no one could understand a word they said, and this time, the NCO was unable to stop them. If it was not apparent yet to the invaders, the Germans, knowing that some of their conscripts were of dubious value, over-organized their defenses, but in an effective way. All the men had to do was stay down and shoot whenever someone came into their view. Whereas what would have helped the British-led forces tremendously was naval or air support, 
as for their other objective of taking the headland, that is, the stick of land that shoots out into the channel at Dieppe or near the high ground to the east, was all but impossible, not without more men with bigger guns. But, it has to be said, there were plans for help from the Navy. The Saskatchewans had with them a Captain Harvey Carswell, who was to coordinate with the HMS Brighton. His job was to get close enough to the headland on the western side in front of Dieppe and guide the shells in to chase away or kill enemy troops. But he, like the others, never got past the bridge. So he called in for a mortar team, but their fire could not go far enough to hit the enemy along the hillside. Next, he called the Albrighton itself and ordered a bombardment but their shells were too far off target and it actually threatened the men of A Company and the men of the Special Platoon. The shelling was ordered stopped. Carswell wondered if the Germans were not using their radio detection to locate his signal. Each time he sent something out, they were fired upon. So far, Jubilee gave little reason for jubilation. The force here at Green Beach was cut in half, A Company and much of D Company had gotten across the bridge, but now they were pinned down. The rest of D Company and much of B Company were still on the western side of the bridge, and now the Germans were fully alert and ready to shoot at anything that tried to cross. And just for good measure, the Allies did try to cross the bridge again, but at least three more were wounded, and so they went back. During all this, Colonel Merritt had been trying to organize his men to effectively take on the enemy troops. He was, at times, getting updates through his radio, though again, this was hit and miss. And he was using runners, but they were hit and missed as well, literally, as in bullets. There was only one thing for it. Merritt would have to go to the bridge himself and take matters into his own hands. By the time Merritt showed up at the bridge, Lieutenant Edmondson, to his credit, had come up with a clever idea. They were running a rope under the bridge. That way, they could hand over hand their way across the bridge and use the bridge as a shield. But Merritt, with one glance, sized this maneuver up and immediately told Edmondson to stop. It would take too long. Then, pulling off his helmet, Merritt swung it around like it was a toy by its strap, and he walked to the middle of the bridge. Almost immediately, bullets started whizzing by the colonel. When he was halfway across, he yelled for Lieutenant Nesbitt and 17 Platoon to follow him. They, in shock, did as they were ordered. The men followed Merritt back to his side, all the while he was calmly walking. And not one man with him was hit. Insert joke here about how these stormtroopers must have taught the Germans how to shoot. Then Merritt went back across the bridge, this time for B Company. The colonel did this at least four times. But it has to be said, the first group was the only group to make it back unscathed. The other groupings did have men that fell. Either way, when it was all done, the survivors gathered in a gray house about 100 yards from the bridge, and they still couldn't believe it. But their way was not yet clear or rather, it had been cleared earlier. Before them was a machine gun nest, and some of Merritt's men had arrived and killed these men, but now, obviously, more Germans had rushed forward to take their place. And the machine gun could easily now mow down Merritt's entire group. This time, Merritt had a lone mortar fired at the pillbox along with a few rounds of smoke, and with that, he walked up to the pillbox, again calmly, and threw in a bomb. With that threat neutralized, next they had to get on a road to get to their next objective. But it was out in the open, which meant death was nearby. But so too was Colonel Merritt. He asked the men, will you follow me? And they all agreed. So he started walking down the road, and they followed. He stopped after 40 yards to look around, and then started walking again. Finally, a decent amount of men had gotten off the beach. It took time, but soon the men were on the slopes below the Quat Vents Farms, and here were six 88mm AA guns 
and four 105 millimeter guns that had to be taken out, or else these guys would never be allowed to leave. And just as D Company got there, so did some Camerons and U.S. Ranger Marcel Swank. And his story of getting there was as horrid as everyone else's. Swank had gone ashore with another Ranger, Sergeant Lloyd Church, but also a Cameron sergeant whose job it was to keep them alive. But soon after entering Portville, a mortar landed close to the three men. The Cameron was dead and Church was gone. Swank woke up and he started walking east, knowing that was where the main attack was supposed to be, and he wanted to contribute something. Soon, he ran into a few Saskatchewans and Camerons, and they went with D Company back to the farms. But as much as this polyglot or mixture of men tried, they could not get through. The mortars that needed to be knocked out near the farms were protected by machine gun fire and the Allies' mortars were back in town. These men tried and tried, but all they got for their pain was six dead and many wounded. So, giving up, smoke was thrown out, and the men began to back up, helping the wounded who needed it. While walking back to Portville, Colonel Merritt had some of his men head for A Company, who were still trying to get to the radar station. There, Jack Nissenthal had managed to cut the telephone wires so the operators inside would have to use radio communication, which was hardly 100% efficient, and it might actually help, in a negative way, the Germans' ability to focus their troops. But that was the limit of his success that day. But like the farm, there were mortars protected by machine guns, and all this surrounded by barbed wire. And sticking with the theme of not accomplishing a goal, the Camerons walking up the west side of the sea were also forced to halt as German crossfire had them dead to rights. What the Camerons and everyone else needed were the Calgary tanks that were landing closer to Dieppe. But as these men had been on the land for three hours, clearly those tanks weren't coming here, even though that had been one of the many, many pieces of this plan. No, the best the men could do was hunker down, protect themselves, and wait for the order to embark. But as they could not get to Dieppe, where were they supposed to exit from? They guessed all would be heading back down to the same beach they had just come from. All the while, with more and more enemy troops closing in, not to mention the Panzers. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I hope you enjoyed the story, and I hope you enjoyed the interview. The book was amazing. I'm a big fan of Andrew Nagorski's. He's done several books that I've tried to get him on. Finally, I got him on the show. So uh, check it out. Um, as far as people who have donated or become members, let's see what we got here. Latest members, Valerie Morrissey from Glen Carbon, Illinois, and Public Works Group from Geneva, Illinois. Obviously, Illinois is here to represent. Uh, let's see here. As far as donations, Lindsey Brown, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Forand, if I'm saying that right, and he became a member. So, Michael, thank you very much. And he is from Lynchburg, 30 minutes from me. So, howdy, neighbor. How's it going? And let's see. Finally, the last person who donated, Mark Stranian. So, thank you very much, Mark. Um i got a couple more interviews coming up, but again, I will couple them with the episodes, uh, normal episodes to keep this going. Thank you very much for listening. Check out Saving Freud. Uh, you'll enjoy it a lot. Take care, everyone.